Hello and welcome to Frankly Speaking, where we dive deep into regional headlines and speak with leading policymakers and business leaders. I am Katie Jensen. As the bloodshed in Gaza shows no signs of abating, on this episode we hear from Ambassador Muni Akram, the permanent representative of Pakistan to the United Nations. We ask him whether he expects the UN to send peace troops to Gaza after his recent request, whether Pakistan is willing to intervene in the conflict and why the international community has failed so miserably to end this conflict. Ambassador, thank you for joining us today on Frankly Speaking. Now, you recently made headlines when you spoke at the United Nations General Assembly and you spoke about the ongoing conflict in Gaza. Now, you said the original sin of this conflict were not the events of October 7, but rather the ongoing Israeli occupation of Palestinian territories. Now, frankly speaking, given the huge backlash you've since received from pro-Israeli groups, do you still maintain this view or do you take it back? <laughs> no, this is the truth. I don't take the truth back. Uh, I, I think it's quite obvious to anybody with any sense of fairness that the problem has arisen because of uh, Israel's 50 years of occupation of Palestine. Uh, the murder and killing of Palestinians with impunity over, over these decades and especially in recent years, you've, we've seen uh, the manner in which uh, the Palestinians have been treated and uh, with regard to the Israeli occupation. Uh, I think I am absolutely confident in my view that when you push a people into a corner, when you suppress them and you kill their children, they will react. And this is what has happened. But you've since been called anti-Semitic, you've been called a terrorist sympathizer as well. How do you respond to those kind of accusations? My background is Semitic myself, so I don't, I don't accept the epithet of being anti-Semitic, hardly uh, anti-Semitic. It is a matter of justice, not, not of race. Well, let's talk a little bit about how the United Nations operates, because, of course, you are a longtime veteran diplomat. I'd be interested to get your thoughts, because we see the killing of innocent lives. Obviously, the killing of any civilians, one life is too many. But it does seem to be quite a different approach. We see quite a serious condemnation when we see the loss of Israeli civilian life, but a very different approach to Palestinian deaths. Why do you think that is? This is the nature of the world order in which we live. There are double standards and triple standards, uh, a discrimination against some and discrimination for others. Uh, this is the root uh, of our problems in, in the world we live in today, is double standards. We have principles, we have international law, we have international humanitarian law. That should be applicable uniformly and universally to everyone. Uh, but that is not the case. Uh, the Israelis, uh, unfortunately, have this sense of impunity, the, the sense that they can go and kill people, they can uh, go and assassinate people, and then get away with it and claim it, while whereas others, when they do something like what Hamas did, are called terrorists. Uh, so I, I think this is the, the double standards is the root cause of the weakness of the international order we, we have today, and that has to be rectified. Uh, people need justice. People need to be treated the same way in the basis of the same laws, the same principles that we all espouse. Okay, so you say clearly there are double standards taking place in the international community today. Let's talk about some of the facts and figures, because as it stands, more than 8,500 people have been killed in Gaza. More than 3,500 of those are children. In fact, officials this week have said that one child is being killed every 10 seconds. And what seems particularly mind-boggling is that while all of this killing is happening in Gaza, the Hamas leadership is not even there. 
In your opinion, what would it take to stop this massacre? Well, I think it's obvious that what needs to happen is a ceasefire. We need to halt the hostilities, halt the aerial bombardment, the invasion of Gaza, the killing that is taking place. And we saw that uh, with, the, with the attack on the refugee camp. Uh, this is uh, unnecessary slaughter of civilians. Uh, with whatever military objectives that may be, international humanitarian law prohibits the targeting and killing of civilians, and that is happening with impunity, impunity today. And, uh, and certain powers are unable to agree to a ceasefire. This is mind-boggling. It is, it is a violation of international law uh, in the most visible and, and, and violent way and I think the international community needs to stand up for the principles that we all espouse here at the United Nations. Well, this week we've heard there is no chance of a ceasefire. Now, I have to wonder then, you recently made a proposal to the United Nations calling for the deployment of peacekeeping troops to be sent into Gaza. Now, given we're not going to see a ceasefire, how likely is it that this kind of measure could ever be passed? Well... I think that obviously what we spoke of it is an international protection force. This has been proposed by the foreign ministers of the Islamic Conference uh, meeting in Jeddah. Uh, I believe that obviously such a protection force would have to be inducted only after a ceasefire happens. It cannot happen in the middle of a war that is going on. Uh, and I believe that that could be a longer term stabilizing factor to have a protection force to protect uh, the, the civilians on, on both sides for, uh, for that matter. Uh, and it would be, I think, a stabilizing force and could lay the ground for the opening of subsequent negotiations for a political settlement. Uh, so it is, a, it is a proposal for stabilizing situation as a way out uh, to what the Israelis say, we are being targeted. Well, you know, so are the Palestinians. Uh, let's have a let's have a force which will keep the two apart. Okay, so whether we, d whether we do see a measure like this pass, whether there is an opportunity uh, to see peacekeeping troops sent there. Now, should such a measure be approved by the UN, would Pakistan then, would Pakistan be willing to send troops? Well, I, I think obviously that will, that will depend on, on the negotiations. Uh, my, my question would be, would Israel be willing to accept Pakistani troops? Uh, so we will have to have negotiations as to the composition of the force, uh, but certainly a, an impartial force, a force which, uh, which can act as a buffer between the two sides, uh, I think could be useful. So if Israel was willing to accept Pakistani troops, is that a move that you would back? Well, certainly, you know, Pakistan uh, has sent 230,000 troops to UN peacekeeping missions over the last 40 years. Uh, and we certainly are a major peace, peacekeeper, a major troop contributing country to UN peacekeeping uh, in that context. Where certainly Pakistan would be willing, uh, of course, if we are accepted by uh, all sides. Well, I ask in particular because your government voted against military support in 2016 with Yemen. So is this situation different and, and how so? Well, well, certainly, I think there can be no comparison to what was happening in Yemen and what is happening now. Uh, Yemen was a civil war, uh, and Pakistan's policy always has been not to intervene in civil wars. This is a major invasion, a occupation by a foreign power of the Palestinian territories, uh, and, and certainly this is, some, uh, this is a completely different situation. Well, let's talk about the legality surrounding this conflict. Uh, we recently spoke with Francesca Albanese on this program. She is a special rapporteur for Palestine for the United Nations. Now, she said the much repeated claim that Israel has the right to defend itself actually doesn't really apply to a country that is also at the same time an occupying power. Do you agree with that same theory? Absolutely. This is exactly what we've said in the Security Council. If, if you see my, the first statement which Pakistan made on this, uh, uh, when this conflict broke out, uh, stated clearly that a power which is occupying another people 
does not, c cannot claim the right to self-defense against those people that it is occupying. Uh, I, I think the law on this is absolutely clear. The uh, demand and the, uh, and the claim made by Israel and his friends that it has the right to defend itself does not apply, uh, is not legally um, defensible in this, in this situation. Well, I ask because in previous statements you have said that the struggle of the people, namely the Palestinians, living under occupation cannot equate to that of terrorism. Do you think that applies when it comes to Hamas? Well, Hamas has not been declared a terrorist organization. Uh, you know, by the international community. It may have been declared... Well, uh, many, many countries do classify it as a terrorist organization. Yes. Well, well, those, mm. Yeah, those are friends of Israel. Um, uh, and and they, they may claim Hamas to be a terrorist organization. As far as we are concerned, we go by international definitions, international acceptance. And so far, Hamas has not been declared a terrorist organization by the Security Council. It is not on the Security Council's list of terrorist organizations. So I think the situation is, is a little different here. Um, and, and therefore, you know, we would not go so far. We can say it's an insurgency, it's a militant organization, it's, a, it's an organization struggling for the Palestinians, whatever you can call them. Uh, but at the moment, the international community has not classified Hamas as a terrorist organization. That, that is a fact. Okay, but just for the record, Mr. Ambassador, your country, Pakistan, does not condone the killing of civilians on either side. Is that correct? No, absolutely not. We, this is what we have said. We want the universal and uniform application of international law, especially international humanitarian law, to all sides. And therefore, we cannot condone the wanton killing of civilians by anybody. Well, let's talk uh, a little bit more widely here about the conflict because your country, Pakistan, has taken a pro-Palestinian position, which is in direct contrast to India, a country you've had a long-standing dispute with. They appear to have sided with Israel, so much so, in fact, that the Guardian newspaper has called out Prime Minister Modi's position as quite the departure from positions which were not so blatantly pro-Israeli. Uh, how would you explain Delhi's new policy? Well, if, I think it is very easy to explain that policy. India itself is practicing the same policies as Israel. It is denying self-determination to the people of Kashmir. It has put 900,000 troops into ca occupied Kashmir to suppress the right of self-determination of the Kashmiri people. It is killing Kashmiri civilians with impunity and it doesn't want to be criticized for what it is doing. It therefore makes common cause with Israel and it should be bracketed in the same position as Israel, as an occupying power in Kashmir. Do you think we're likely to see the same uh, comment, the same view shared by the international community when it comes to that in terms of being an occupying power? Well, certainly uh, the international community has recognized Jammu and Kashmir as disputed territory. And India does not have a right to be in occupation of a disputed territory. It has been called to uh, allow a plebiscite in Kashmir to enable the people of Jammu and Kashmir to exercise the right of self-determination. It has not allowed that. It has suppressed that right. It has imposed its own conditions on the Kashmiri people. Uh, the international community therefore recognizes in Security Council resolutions the legitimacy of Pakistan's position, which is that allow the Kashmiri people to exercise the right to self-determination in accordance with the Security Council resolutions provisions. This is a legal position and the international community has not resulted from that position and we therefore uh, are seeking the application of that resolution in Jammu and Kashmir and we hope that the international community will accept our position and agree to press India to allow the Kashmiri people the right to self-determination. 
Well, Ambassador, I'm sure your Indian counterpart would strongly disagree with you on that. And perhaps this is a conversation for another time when uh, we can press you on that a little bit more. Because uh, I want to focus more specifically on the conflict in Gaza. Let's turn our attention there. It does feel like this conflict it is no longer primarily Arab-Israeli. We've now seen the US deploy several aircraft carriers. Russia and China are getting involved too. Would you say this is now an international crisis? We are facing the danger of an international crisis. And that is another reason, apart from the humanitarian reasons of Palestinian children and women being killed, uh, there is also a strategic reason, and that is the danger that this conflict could uh, spread, a conflict could escalate, and it could have dangerous implications, not only for the region, but for the world as a whole, when you have major powers become involved in a conflict and the threat of uh, the danger of that happening is, uh, is palpable. And you said earlier that Pakistan would be willing to send peacekeeping troops. So I have to ask, would Pakistan be willing to get involved militarily? Um, I, don't, I hope that that doesn't happen. We would not want to. We do not want to get involved militarily in this conflict. Uh, and we think that even talking about it is dangerous. Uh, and, and we would want to see a peaceful solution. That's what we're working for. But is that a yes or a no? That's a no. That's a no. Okay. Well, I asked that question because Pakistan is the only Muslim nuclear power. And I have to wonder, would that weapon be used to defend Islamic countries? Should they be threatened if this conflict is not contained? Well, you know, there are other means of attempting to bring peace than military intervention. Uh, interna the Which inter so far have failed. They have failed so far, but doesn't mean that we should stop trying. Uh, there is a moral force, there is a legal force, there are economic measures that can be taken, there are political measures that can be taken, there are legal uh, measures that can be taken to convince Israel and its supporters to stop the war. That is what we have to try first and foremost, uh, is to find peaceful ways of stopping this conflict. But is that working so far? Because we, you know, recently we heard Antonio Guterres obviously condemned the October 7 attacks, but he also said this incident did not happen in a vacuum. And we we're talking about a 75 year old conflict. Clearly, the previous ways have not worked. What is going to be different now? Well, I hope something is different. I believe that the enormity of the crimes that are being committed uh, in Gaza today is something that should move in the international conscience uh, and hopefully if there is a sufficient groundswell of support uh, in the entire world including the western world where Israel has found support uh, that if there is an international con conscience is mobilized we could see a change in the positions of those who are um, uh, complicit in uh, not halting this war. But how, how then do you see this crisis ending, Mr. Ambassador? Where, where do we go from here? Well, uh, I would hope that, uh, first of all, there would be a cessation of hostilities. If, it, it, uh, if that does not happen, then the danger of the conflict spreading escalates. Uh, so we will have to find ways to respond if Israel does not stop the war and the Arab and the OIC countries will have to get together to find ways of exerting further pressure on Israel and its supporters. Uh, and obviously there are several ways that uh, we could think of that, that that can happen. So we will try everything possible Sh uh, short of a conflict to try and bring this to an end and bring this to a just uh, and in the final analysis war has to stop the two sides have got to get back to talking about the creation of a two-state solution because 
in, I believe there is a general consensus that that is the only durable solution. And it is only the extremists who are leading Israel today who have uh, denied that. The uh, entire world believes that a two-state solution is the answer, and we must get back to that track as soon as possible. Well, let's hope that happens. Of course, no ceasefire has been agreed at the moment. Netanyahu in recent days has warned it will be a long and tough war ahead. And who knows how many more lives are going to be lost. But Ambassador, thank you for joining us today on Frankly Speaking. We appreciate your insights. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.